Wow, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here tonight. I hope to share some of my dreams about powering the planet sustainably with you and give you some concrete numbers that I believe we have to achieve to get there and how we can get there. I also hope to inspire a few of you, maybe many of you, to take action, both because of how important this is, but also because of how big an opportunity this is. Well, as you heard, my passion for this started quite early. I was 15 years old. It was 1973. I grew up in San Fernando Valley, and we had a big gas crisis. And I, uh, these pictures remind me of what I saw. You, you used to have to buy gasoline on odd and even numbered days based on your license plate. And there were lines that were usually a mile long at the gas stations uh, just to get five gallons. They had uh, rationing. You usually could get between three and five gallons. And I remember at the time thinking how ridiculous that was. Uh, what had happened, OPEC had formed and had uh, formed a cartel to increase the price of gasoline. And it sent shockwaves around the world. I remember thinking there's got to be some way to do something about this. I started dreaming about solar energy back then as a potential way to do that. Uh, fortunately, I uh, had a high school metal shop that I could start working on these projects with. Uh, and uh, I remember I started working on ideas to make Stirling engines and heat engines. And everybody who came up to me in metal shop who was welding or working on motorcycles and things came up. And while I was working on these Stirling engines, they kept saying, you're making a bong, aren't you? You're making a really incredible I said, no, no, I'm actually working on a Stirling engine. Oh, yeah, yeah. I thought that was a great excuse to be able to use the lathes. <laughs> Uh, but I was actually working on Stirling engines, and um, uh, this was my first sketch of a Stirling engine back then. I wanted to make a heat engine that could run off the sun, try and make my contribution to powering the planet back then. And this was my first sketch, and this was my first actual engine. It was my first running heat engine. I was so excited about this that I made plans for this. I made some kits for it. I even made a small parabolic concentrator so I could take this outside and actually make it turn from the sun. And I started a little small mail order business called Solar Devices. We ha I had these little mail order catalogs. I'd take out ads in the back of Popular Science Magazine, Scientific American Magazine, and I'd sell these plans for $4, and I'd print them at Kinko's for $0.25. Cents. And actually, over the years, uh, from when I was 15, 16, 17, 18, I sold 10,000 of these plans. So the, the $40,000 from that actually paid my tuition through college. It was really, really remarkable that people were so interested in this back then that they were being, buying plans from a 15-year-old in Sherman Oaks. Uh, 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 no internet, so I had to do mail order, but I remember going to the library and learning everything I could about mail order and doing all the testing and all the different things that you would do in mail order. And of course, I've taken that forward. I did some of that stuff on the internet uh, when, when the first web browsers were invented. But I was really, really passionate about this. And I went to Caltech in uh, 1976, and I continued the business for my first two years at Caltech. And then the cartel formed um, to drive down the price to stop all investment in renewables. Everybody in the world was thinking about renewables at that time, and there were wind farms starting to be built and other things that would really help this take off. But then the price collapsed, and there was no interest in solar energy at all. When I graduated in 1981, there was absolutely no interest in solar energy at all anywhere in the world, I don't think. And uh, coincidentally, when all that interest dried up, that was the year the IBM PC came out. And I remember buying the first IBM PC from Computerland on Lake Avenue in Pasadena and saying, well, I can't do anything with solar right now. Nobody cares about that, but uh, I can learn how to write software. And I started working on some software products. I had a 15-year detour creating software. First, I made a little accounting program, and then I made a, a natural language program for Lotus 123, and then Lotus acquired that company, moved back to Boston, learned everything about the software industry. And then when David, who's here tonight, when David started kindergarten in 1991, I left Lotus I was really passionate about making an educational software company. I've been really fortunate. I had an amazing fourth grade teacher that made me fall in love with learning. And I thought it would be really important, sort of that magical day when I handed David off to the school system, when I waved goodbye as I pulled away from, from kindergarten playground. I wanted him to fall in love with learning. I wanted to make educational software to help that. So I started this company, Knowledge Adventure. And we made Knowledge Adventure, and we made Space Adventure with Buzz Aldrin. We made Dinosaur Adventure. Then we made this Jumpstart series, Jumpstart Kindergarten, Jumpstart First Grade, a whole bunch of products. They took off really well. I had great gratification from really working on something I was greatly passionate about. But still, that solar energy bug was still itching in the background, but the world didn't care about it still. Oh, pretty much through the whole 1990s, no one cared about that. Uh, the Internet browser was invented. Netscape went public in 1995. And I felt there was a great opportunity to do things online. And I started Idealab in 1996, a year after the Netscape IPO. Idealab is a technology incubator in Pasadena. And we developed this process to brainstorm ideas, take them through various phases of, of testing, uh, kill the bad ones, uh, uh, patent the good ones, and try and form companies around them, hire people, recruit people to go into them. Uh, we've hired many, many people from Harvey Mudd over the years to go into these various companies, and we're really excited about that. And uh, 
we try and take this process in a very rigorous way in every type of company we do. And I was making these internet companies, and basically, for the, for the, as you heard, for the last 15 years, these are the first 100 companies that we started over the last 15 years in all different areas. But then what happened in 2000, that's when I was able to go back to my true love. And uh, what happened was I began thinking about energy again. There was a, I was hearing there was going to be a big problem in the world, and in particular in California, there were rumors there were going to be uh, energy shortages that summer that uh, because of all the machinations of Enron and gas prices, there, there were going to be mass blackouts in California. I heard about this in like January, February of 2000. And I started thinking about making a product. This was still why we were making Internet companies, making a product that could store energy for a household. I wanted to try and make a whole house UPS, something that people could buy maybe for $3,000, like an air conditioner unit that they could put in the back of their house that would power their house through blackouts. And I started researching that. I thought that would be a really great product, and that went through our idea lab process of trying to test it and figure out this way we could do it. And we looked at all the different energy storage methods, batteries and flywheels and all the other methods, and basically concluded it was impossible. You could do it, but it cost $60,000, not $3,000. And it is extremely, extremely hard to store energy cost effective. And that's still a big problem. That's a big opportunity today. I'll talk more about that a little bit later. But after I concluded that you couldn't effectively store energy, I decided maybe we could actually make the energy at your house. Maybe I should go back and look at the research that had happened over the last 20 years and try and see what, is, what has progressed. And now I actually have a budget. Now I actually have a company with laboratory space and a machine shop, and I have learned how to hire people. And I'm not working on my 15-year-old budget with little mail order business. I actually can put resources on this if we could find a way. So I started looking at how we could possibly make solar energy cost effective. And I really concluded that it just was going to have to be cost effective. And uh, what, what led me to get so excited about it again was that we're running out of resources, and this is basically going to continue over the history of the planet with the number of people we have, and that there was going to be a big catastrophe sometime this century if we don't come up with some other way of getting our energy other than by burning things. And I really decided to dedicate the rest of my life to really trying to find a way to do that, to both invest in it, other people doing it, but also to work on this myself. And I'll tell you some of the things that we've done so far and hopefully give you some areas of opportunity that other people need to work on. And one of the things that led me really directly to go after this was a speech I heard by Nate Lewis. So the speech that you guys heard last week, many of you who were here, um, I heard years ago, and it was really, really impactful to me to show how serious the problem was. But I, I felt he didn't talk about enough of the possibilities for the answers. I wanted to really look at what some of the answers would be to address the serious problem he was posing. And the serious problem he was posing, I'll just restate it very quickly. The whole world uses 15 terawatts. You look at the whole planet, this kind of shows uh, this symbol symbolizes man's intense energy usage all over the world. And if you take the total 15 terawatts that the whole Earth uses and divide by 6.5 billion people, it's 2,300 watts per person. So every person on the planet has 2,300 watts working for them all day long, 24 hours a day. But here in the United States, we're only 5% um, uh, of the population, but we use 33% of the energy. So we have a much higher number than 2,300 watts. All of us in the United States, it's more like... 12 kilowatts, maybe 15 kilowatts. And those of us in this room, probably a little above average wealth, a little above average in comfort, cars, we travel by plane, we're probably using closer to 20 or 25 kilowatts constantly. 25 kilowatts are constantly running in the background to make our lives the way they are. Well, as the rest of the world lifts itself out of poverty or tries to become like us, and that's pretty much the first thing that people want to do when they get lifted out of poverty is start being like us. First thing that happens in China when people start making get past the subsistence living is they want a car and the next thing they want is they want a home and they want air conditioning and they want the same things we have and then they're going to just approach our 25 kilowatts so that accounts for the huge gap that we have the 15 terawatts where we are today and where we need to go and just as an example uh, j just to see uh, uh, that that number of horses basically is running after us doing all of our stuff all day long and uh, back when we had to take care of the horses uh, we would we would see the power we'd see how much work we had to put in to keep the power fed and, and happy uh, but now that we just flip a light switch and the power plant's far away and the emissions are spewed and copper is very insidious copper allows us to not see or smell that stuff and just turn the light switch and quietly have the lights on in the room if we actually saw how much energy and stuff was being exerted to give what we have right now, we, we would be blown away. And, and, and that's what we have to try and solve in a more renewable way, sustainable way, as opposed to the burning way. But one other thing that's very interesting about this is almost every other species on Earth consumes about 6% to 11% more than the actual energy that they put out. So, you know, if an ant moving along has a microwatt, you know, it's 6% it's, it's more than that is what it gets from other sources, the total energy it pulls in from other places. We consume 100x. Not 6% more, 10% more, but 100x. So the total amount that our bodies produce, 
there's another 99 of us running around along, giving us our comfort in our life. So it's just amazing that, uh, that that's possible. It's given us the lifestyle that we have, but it's those 99 other people that sort of need to be fed, that are being fed by burning stuff that we have to try and come up with some way around. And um, uh, another amazing fact is how much we love our fossil fuel. Um, uh, just last year, this happened. Uh, in America, there's 1.8 people per household and 1.9 cars per household. So there's more cars per household than there are people. And, and that just shows how, how we just have a love affair with burning stuff to make our lives convenient. And uh, it's going to lead to real problems if we don't get away around it. And we're going to get away around it. It's going to matter how we're going to get there and how, how quickly can we get there. So here's um, uh, imagination of what the Earth might look like in 2050 when we have 50 terawatts of demand. And that's just taking modest population growth and not even bringing up the rest of the world to the United States level. It's just bringing up the rest of the world to halfway to the United States level. There's 50 terawatts. So there's this 35 terawatt gap. The 15 terawatts we're using right now, which is already pretty bad, to the 50 terawatts that we'll want. And Nate talked uh, eloquently about this and really what led me to focus on solar so much that there's a 35 terawatt gap and there's only really six places we can get that from and uh, on the scale that we need. And we have to do all of them, but the other ones have limitations. The other ones have limitations because as Nate points out so beautifully, even if you go put a windmill in all the windy places on the planet, you can only really come up with about three terawatts. If you build a nuclear power plant every day for the next 35 years, you can only get about two terawatts. Um, if you take advantage of almost all the tidal energy, if you, if you put biomass in almost all the arable land so there'd be no land left for food, you can get three terawatts. It just shows you the magnitude of 35 terawatts. So the only thing that can get us there really is the sun because the sun strikes the earth with 15,000 terawatts, a full 10,000 times more you know, than, than what we really use today. So there's really the, the opportunity if we can convert the sun's energy cost effectively to really make up that gap. And the other great thing about the sun, aside from the plentifulness of it, is that it's really, really uniformly distributed. If you look around the Earth at almost every natural resource, I think the only thing that is as evenly distributed as the sun across the planet is air, because it, it's everywhere. You can see on this map, there are some areas where there's pretty low sunshine, like the white areas on the very top, but, and the very, very bottom of, of South America. But just about everywhere else, there's enough sunshine to be able to harness cost effectively. And you can pretty much get the electricity or, or other um, uh, energy that you want to create from the sun to the white areas through transportation and other distribution methods if necessary. So it really is very, very uni uniformly dis dis deployed uh, compared to almost everything else we get on Earth it's localized. You know, some minerals are in this place, some countries are great at this, some people can export that, but the sun's really everywhere, and that's a really great thing about it. Also, it doesn't take much land. It does take land, but it doesn't take much, and here's an example, just illustrates it. Nate showed something like this as well, but basically, uh, with, with a decent system, like, like an e-solar system, which I'll talk about, a, a rectangle square 83 miles by 83 miles would power the whole United States and 240 miles by 240 miles were powered the whole planet. Now, you wouldn't have to put it all in one place like this. You spread it out all over, but that just puts in, in perspective, you know, it's a tiny fraction of the land that we have crops on, or a tiny fraction of roof space, or a tiny fraction of parking lots. Uh, it, the land is really there to do it, and, and that makes it really possible. So if we're going to invent this future, you know, how, how can we possibly get there? And I sort of feel from the way I've observed uh, the way we make change on the planet, there's, there's three ways you can change the world. You can be a preacher and go try and persuade people. You can be a politician and try and make the laws and force people. Or you can be an inventor and just make things happen because the things get pulled because you make an invention that people want. And if we want to have a positive impact on the planet, we have to do one of these methods, at least one of these methods. But I love being an inventor. You can find the things that are wrong with the world. You can use the resources that you have to solve the physics or solve the chemistry or solve the problem around it. And then it's just you up against that. There's, there's no politician that can get in the way of that if you actually can make the economics work and actually make people pull your product. It's just sort of marketing 101. So it's a tough, a tough physics problem to solve, but a great marketing problem to solve if you can actually make the impact there. So I, I love uh, trying to be the inventor part of this, and I'll try and show you how we can apply invention to this process to try and make this work. So Nate also showed, uh, well, if it's so obvious that we use the sun, why, why isn't it happening? And the reason is it's too expensive. So basically, uh, most electricity is in the cost in the five to six cent range per kilowatt hour to produce. In California, we pay about 12 to 13 cents a kilowatt hour, but that's because the power company charges something for distribution and has a profit. But basically, to, to make it, that's the cost. And the cheapest solar energy back in 2002, this was a graph that Nate showed, cheapest solar energy back in 2002 was 25 cents, so four times as much. 
So the only person who's going to pay four times as much as something for something that they can get for four times less is someone who really has a big emotional reason to do it, or if you have no electricity, like if you're off-grid, but it's just really hard to sustain paying four times as much for something when there's something else that's just equivalent for such a lower price. In fact, I would argue that electrons coming out of the socket are the single most commoditized item there is in the world. Like even commodities are less commoditized than electrons. Uh, be because commodities, well, take aluminum. You could have different grades of aluminum. You could have different finish. You could have different purity. You could have different, uh, by location, it could be w worth more. But the electrons are electrons. I mean, they're literally identical, the ones that come out of this socket or another socket. So th they are really, really commoditized. So that makes it very hard for people to pay more for something. You know, people levelize, things levelize very uh, quickly when they're undifferentiated and the electrons are pretty undifferentiated. So back in 2002, it was four times too expensive. But since then, there have been good, good advancements. In the last eight years, people, uh, solar cell production, other types of solar have progressed a lot. And natural gas and coal, which are down in the six cent, five cent range, solar is gradually coming down. It's actually now approaching double. It's now approaching 12 cents per kilowatt hour. So still double, you know, much better than four times, but double. And so most people aren't going to do it. Now, the, the main people who are doing it, are places where there's big subsidies. So Germany has very big sub subsidies. Spain has big subsidies. U.S. has modest subsidies. U.S. has a 30% subsidy. Basically, there's a 30% investment tax credit. So effectively, it's, it's like giving you a 30% discount if you put a solar system in. So if you could make the solar electricity for uh, 20 cents per kilowatt hour, you get a 30% discount. You get from the government 6 cents, so it would come out to be about 14 cents. Still not competitive with natural gas and coal. Maybe with other techniques, you could get it down. But if you can make it for 12, you can get darn close to natural gas, at least on the cost. Uh, you can even beat the solar price that you're paying as a retail customer. So that's why some people are installing solar in California. If you can get it down to about 15 cents, get a 30% discount, you can barely beat the price you're paying, and some people are doing it. But only because of the subsidy. So if you only do it because of the subsidy, you're limited to the size of the subsidy. So for example, in Germany, in Germany, they have very bad sunshine. They have a very big subsidy to make up for it. They're paying you like 50 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity you generate from solar panels. They used to be paying 50 euro cents per kilowatt, kilowatt hour, which was like $1,000 a few years ago. <laughs> uh, 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 but now it's down to like 90 cents. But, but they're, they're, they're paying um, a very big subsidy that makes it very affordable for a person to install it, but very unaffordable for the government to sustain it. And especially after the depression we just had, it's very hard for governments to continue sustaining that. Spain had a very big subsidy of like 35 euro cents, and they have better sunshine than Germany, significantly better. It was very cost effective to put systems in Spain. Spain was going gangbusters, and then their real estate crisis happened, sort of like ours, and now the government's out of money, and they had to cancel it. So the programs that were in place, the systems that were put in place, will continue to get paid the 35 cents for the 20-year duration of their contract, but new systems have halted. So whenever you have a system that's going to get halted, when the subsidy stops, you can't, that's not going to work. That's not going to make it go. So we've got to beat six cents. We really have to get close to six cents. Now, the other way we can beat six cents is the six cents could go up a little bit. So if there was any externality price on the price of natural gas, on, on the carbon emitted from coal or natural gas, that might creep up to seven or eight. And then now that gets within reach. Or, of course, as the economic recession ends, there'll be more demand in the world, and those prices will go up. Coal prices are going up slowly. I, I draw them in a straight line here, but they're actually been going up slowly. Main reason they're going up is because new coal plants have to have new emission requirements, so it costs more to build a new coal plant than it costs to build an old coal plant. The coal is cheap, but the coal plant is more expensive, so that gets factored into the price. So we're getting within striking distance. I want to talk to you uh, some of my views of how we get there, first by telling you how hard it is to get there. So just l let me, let me uh, talk about this graph. Uh, right now, the level you need to get to to really make solar compete is roughly in the $100 per square meter range. Uh, here's what the problem is with solar. Solar is an enormous resource, but it's very diffuse. It's only 1,000 watts per square meter. 1,000 watts per square meter strikes the surface of the Earth. About 1,350 watts strikes the outside of the atmosphere, and 1,000 watts per square meter hits the Earth on a bright, sunny day. Well, that's a lot of energy, but it's very diffuse. Just to give you an example, a hair dryer is 1,000 watts per square inch. You know, I have a little uh, mouth of a hair dryer. It might even be 1,500 watts out of one, in one square inch, so it's like... 2,000 times as dense as the solar energy striking the Earth. So the problem is taking this big diffuse thing and converting that energy effectively, you have to get the price down, and you have to get the price down to about $100 a square meter. Well, the panels cost $264 a square meter. The cheapest China SunTech panel currently costs $264 a square meter, and that's before you install it. 
after you install it, it's like $500 a square meter. So with subsidies and other things, and with high prices, you can get that to be competitive, but we really have a big way to go to get that down. It's, it might even be impossible to get that down low enough with the standard thinking. And just to give you an example of how hard that is, just to put down synthetic hardwood flooring material costs like $60 a square meter, and carpeting with decent padding is like $40 a square meter. So, and those won't last outdoors for 20 hours, and those don't convert sunlight to electricity. Those are just passive things that just sit there. So to actually convert sunlight to electricity and last for 20 years, and the lasting for 20 years part is essential, because the only way you make this work is the thing that you make has to produce power for enough time to amortize the cost to work back to that price per kilowatt hour. So if the thing worked for a year, that wouldn't do it, because then you have to replace it every year, and that blows the price too. So it's very very, very hard to even make a passive thing you could put in the sun that would just sit still and not get ruined in 20 years, let alone put out electrons. Uh, a regulated AC electrons line synchronized with the grid. So you can see why this is such a hard problem. But if we do it, it's going to take off like a rocket ship. I mean, if you can actually get down to that kind of magic number, it's actually possible to compete with fossil fuels, and then there'll just be so much demand, it'll be incredible. So uh, where is this breakthrough going to come from? As I said before, it's going to come from chemistry or biology or physics. It can come from many different areas. I think it's going to be all of them, and I think we need to invest heavily in all of these, and that's why the creativity of people here can really make an impact on that. Uh, let me give you one other observation. If we're going to invent a, a way to drive the cost down, though, where is it going to come from? Well, I have one particular idea for where that could come from, and I think it's going to come from the one thing that has always going, been going down in price. So coal's going up. Let me just show you some of the trends on, on different commodities. Coal's going up and oil's going up. I mean, it has short-term blips where it goes down, but overall it's been going up for decades. Natural gas is going up. Again, we're in a short-term blip down now. Steel's going up. Gold is going up. Platinum's going up. Pretty much everything we dig out of the ground is going up because we have 6.5 billion people. We're taking the limited stuff out of the ground. We're using it up, and um, that's going to make the price go up. Uh, there's no, no, nothing else but supply and demand about that. But even, even things we grow, corn is going up and rice are going up, and you say, why are those going up? We're growing those. We're making those renewably. Well, those are going up because most of the stuff used to make that stuff is energy. Most of the stuff to transport it, to, to fertilize it and all that, and to pick it, that's energy. So if all the energy sources go up, then the price of these the foods go up too. So everything's going up, and yet there's been one thing that's continuously going down and consistently, and that's the price of computation power. So magically, because of the ingenuity of, of uh, engineering and physicists, the, the, this has been happening for a century, uh, but for decades for sure, unbelievable reduction in the cost per MIP, unbelievable reduction in the cost it takes to do a computation. Uh, it's because you're not running out of anything here. There's, there's no wars that we fought over this. Maybe the only thing will be price wars, but no wars fought over a commodity that's running out. You're just making new of this through ingenuity. And that's why, uh, if you can figure out a way to use this, to help drive down the price of energy, that'd be great. Unfortunately, energy doesn't normally obey Moore's law, but I've tried to find ways to work Moore's law into the, a possible energy solution, and I'll give you a few examples of that. Uh, Moore's law is sort of the one thing that's consistent. When you look at all the curves, there's one thing going down and everything else going up, and that's what gave me the aha moment to try and deploy this to make that work, and that's sort of the aha moment behind eSolar, which we'll tell you about in a moment. So several examples from different of our companies. We have a company called Infinia that uses genetic algorithms using Moore's Law to drive down price and drive up efficiency. We have Aptera, a car company. I'll show you pictures of these in a moment. Um, distributed world power using this again. And then eSolar, I'll show you how we've done it there. Infinia is a Stirling Engine company, so I came back to my roots with Stirling Engines and said, how can we try and bring Moore's Law to Stirling Engines to drive the efficiency up and the cost down? Infinia is a company that makes a tracking dish with a Stirling engine, produces three kilowatts, can be deployed all over the world. And this is a cutaway view of a Stirling engine. And traditionally, people have, been, people have been making Stirling engines for 200 years. Robert Stirling invented it in 1806. But no one's been able to make one efficient enough and cost effective enough to really make an impact. What can you do to try and change that? Well, what we did is we made a big computer simulation of a Stirling engine of all the dimensions and all the components. And basically, a Stirling engine is a careful optimization of opposing aerodynamic and thermodynamic forces. And I'll give you an example of, of um, how, how critical this is, but how great software can be in optimizing this. You've got air flowing through a heat exchanger. If you make the passageways more narrow, you get more efficient heat exchange, but you have higher wind resistance. If you make the passageways too big, you have low wind resistance, but you have poor heat exchange. There's going to be some optimization. If you make the fins longer, you're going to be able to get more um, heat out of a given amount of metal, but if you make them longer, you're going to have a temperature decay along the length of the fin that's going to make it worse. Everything's in opposition. There's like 50 different things that are in opposition inside all the parameters of a Stirling engine. 
almost too complicated to solve otherwise. But if you make a big model of it, you can use a genetic algorithm, and you can simulate many, many generations. You can do billions of generations in a week or even in a day, and simulate more engines than you possibly could have made. And we did this, and we actually were able to double the efficiency of a Stirling engine in a given size with a given amount of materials just by optimizing all those variables against one another. Not with a preconceived notion of what the engine would look like, but just by letting the engine generally float using a genetic algorithm and having many, many generations of engines with mutation from each generation and variation in each of the component parts. It's really, really amazing what software can do to try and bring something to this. And another example in a completely different area, we have a car company called Aptera, which is making a 200-mile-per-gallon vehicle. And the goal was to try and make the most streamlined vehicle, the most efficient vehicle that could extremely comfortably fit two passengers side by side. So you can make a car have very, very high efficiency by having zero front frontal area, no profile, you could be lying down in the car. People have made cars like that to win contests, but we want to make a practical vehicle that you could sit upright with safety t t uh, crash standards passed and with good visibility out of all the windows. So we had a certain size of the interior vehicle had to be, but then how do you wrap a shape around that to get the absolute lowest drag, lowest cost of materials, highest, highest structural strength? And in the past, you know, this would take um, uh, you know, many, many, many crash tests billions of dollars probably because they have to build the tooling for the vehicles and do and we were able to basically make a Moore's Taw a Moore's Law wind tunnel as opposed to an actual wind tunnel and simulate millions and millions of different vehicles and come up with the vehicle that would meet all those criteria. And it's it's just incredible what kind of things you can do with this computational power. And I think most of you know this, but it's just great to be able to find ways to apply that to a problem that was previously intractable on the energy side. So the, the result of this, we were able to achieve a car that gets a 200 miles per gallon equivalent, that only weighs 2,000 pounds, fully passed the full U.S. standard crash test, so it's completely safe, and yet can really make a big impact because you know, when you can get five times the mileage or four times the mileage of a Prius but still have almost the same internal envelope, you can really make a difference. And hopefully not everybody's going to drive a car like this because this looks kind of unusual, but uh, it just shows what can be done. You, you could get quite, we were trying to push the boundaries as far as we could, you could take a, a more traditional car, though, and push it above 100 miles per gallon quite easily, uh, if, if that's your goal. And we're, we're hoping with this vehicle to try and get more people to copy this idea. And, you know, we're not going to be able to make enough cars. We're going to try and make 10,000 cars a year and sell these. We have a big waiting list for this if we can get into production soon. But we, we can't make enough cars to change the planet ourselves. But if more and more companies apply these principles, then that can have an overall impact on our fossil fuel use in the transportation sector. And then just as an example to show you how far this goes, uh, uh, th this car, the frontal area times the coefficient of drag. The coefficient of drag turned out to be half of any car ever made before, the lowest uh, street vehicle ever made. But the, the actual frontal area times the coefficient of drag is less than a 10-speed bicycle. So it takes less energy to, propel, to pro propel this through the wind than a person on a bicycle by a factor of 1.62. So it's 1.62 times better than a 10-speed. So it's just incredible what you can do. It's a pretty big thing, too. It's hard to tell from the picture, but it's a pretty big vehicle. It uh, fills a full parking space, sits two people side by side very comfortably. It's, it's quite wide and quite long, actually. But because of the way the wind attaches and detaches from it, it uses less energy to push through the wind than a 10-speed, and, and uh, 1.74 times less than a motorcycle, and three, about three times less than a Prius, and you know, 12 times less than a, than a Hummer, which is basically a box through the, through the air. <laughs> uh, but but uh, it's, this really goes to show uh, uh, what you can do with computational power. And again, in the past, um, uh, even a GM with their budget wouldn't have been able to do the amount of simulations we were able to do you know, in, in a week just with, with a, a, a normal cluster uh, putting the computing power to it. So it's really, really uh, incredible um, uh, what Moore's Law has brought to us. Okay, finally, solar. So I, I gave you those two detours, what we did with Sterling engines, what we did with cars, but with solar. So first, let me give you this, this solar taxonomy and then tell you how you can apply Moore's Law to try and do something here. So first, all the way over on the, on the left, um, you have silicon panels, and some of the big manufacturers' silicon panels are Sharp and SunPower and SunTech. And then you have thin film panels, a new method of making solar panels with less materials. They're less efficient, but they're cheaper. And those are made by First Solar, Nano Solar, a lot of people making those. Um, uh, concentrated solar panels, and then that's over on the photovoltaic side, which converts the sunlight directly to electricity. And then on the right side, on this right fork, are solar thermal, which turns the sunlight into heat and then runs a heat engine of some kind to convert the heat into electricity. Uh, you have sterling dishes, you have parabolic troughs, linear Fresnel parabolic troughs, you have parabolic troughs that rotate with a single uh, uh, focus line that goes along, and then you have the power tower. We looked at all of these, 
and the uh, most complex and highest efficiency, but most expensive, was the power tower. And the power tower is the highest efficiency because it concentrates the sunlight to the highest degree, achieves the highest temperatures, and thus can get the highest efficiency in the heat engine. But it also has the highest complexity and the highest cost because it's a huge construction project. This is a 200-meter uh, tall tower, and the huge heliostats in the field, the mirrors that point to the sun, are enormous parabolas. So we felt maybe we could bring Moore's Law to try and take this great idea uh, and reduce the price of it. So how does Moore's Law do that? So the concept was, the, co the company we created to do that was called eSolar. We started in 2007, and here's what we looked at. We tried to dissect where was the cost overrun in solar thermal power towers, and how could Moore's Law come to the rescue of that? And uh, he here's what we saw. The traditional solar power tower has a mirror, which is about 12 meters by 12 meters, or like I said, about the size of a tennis court, that's up on a pole. That pole has to go about 20 feet into the ground because the wind load on a huge tennis court is going to be quite high. The gearbox at the neck of this has to be incredible. It's actually about the size of a Mercedes and costs about as much as a Mercedes because it has to hold the, uh, against the wind load the, the torque on that whole thing and it's trying to hold that whole thing accurate to about a half a degree because if it's off by half a degree, the sunlight won't hit the tower. It's taking the sunlight beams and bouncing them to a tower, so you need pretty good accuracy there. It's very, very expensive to make this. First of all, this can't be shipped because it's bigger than a shipping container, bigger than, a, bigger than the lane on a highway. So you have to build this at the site. So it means you bring all the materials to the site. You have construction workers working on, on that on site. You have them welding, doing electrical, all that, pouring the concrete, digging the holes. And it's a big construction project. It's like building a bridge. That's very expensive. It doesn't scale. We came up with the idea to break this big mirror up into 100 small mirrors. So if this is 100 square meters, We'll have 101 square meter mirrors over here. They'll all be low to the ground. They'll all be small enough to fit in a shipping container. Each one will be about the size of a plasma screen. The gearbox won't have to be so strong because the wind load on a one square meter thing isn't very much. The mirrors will be close together, so each one will act as a wind barrier to the adjacent mirror, so it actually reduces the load on the adjacent ones. So that reduces the cost of the gearbox. Even though we have more of them, they actually cost less than the one bigger one. But the main problem is we now have to control tons of these. And we can't afford now to go survey the location of each one of these. Because this one, you're doing a huge construction project. You can afford to have the crew survey GPS and with lasers the exact location of this. If you're going to put out tens of thousands of mirrors, you can't afford to do that because the labor would get too high. So that's where software and computation comes in. We decided to replace the steel and concrete and the construction with software and computation. And what we basically get rid of is the cranes and the labor and all that, and we made something that we could just spread out that uses way less steel, way less labor, and way higher accuracy. And the reason we get the higher accuracy is at this small scale, we can put a microprocessor in every single mirror and have a closed-loop feedback, as opposed to what people do with this, which is one big open-loop feedback by surveying the location. And this is what it led to. Uh, we came up with a system. This is what the eSolar field shows up like. Uh, we assemble the whole thing in a factory. All these racks are folded up like an accordion. They're all wired. The wiring is already in here. They're all tested. The motors and gearboxes are all in here. We pull them out of a shipping container from the factory and then open them up like an accordion and just put them down on the ground. And then a crew basically just tightens these down with a wrench to some ballast, some small ballast that are placed on the ground. And the whole thing forms one big array that is linked together so it can't move in the wind. It's been tested 120 mile an hour wind. So the whole thing just sits in the ground. But it's all wavy because the ground isn't flat and they're not putting the rows down perfectly straight. And it's going to be a little bit crooked and all that. But that's okay because software will come to the rescue of that. I'll show you how in a moment. So this is what the field looks like when the workers are putting it down. This is that actual picture from a plant that's in Palmdale. I know some people here uh, took a field trip over there. Uh, it's a really neat place to see if you ever get to see just the scale of this because there's 24,000 mirrors spread out um, o over many acres. And um, uh, this is what it looks like when they're first putting it down. This is what it looks like as the mirrors are being placed on. We walk a little cart down each aisle and connect the mirrors on. And all of this is done very sloppily. None of it has to be very accurate because the software is going to take out all of the errors after the fact. And that's what leads to the cost being very low. So the final stage is, this is what it looks like from the ground level. These racks are moving along. These things are just sitting on the dirt. The mirrors are all connected. The two axis gearboxes right here. There's a microprocessor inside each one of these. And there's a coax cable that runs down the whole thing that connects to a, a computer at the end of the whole run. It's also connected to the internet, so it can be controlled remotely. And after you do this whole thing and put the whole field out there, it's very inaccurate. And that's where the software part comes in. So then we have to go add calibration to figure out where every mirror is and where every mirror is pointing. 
So we can have a very inexpensive field, very low steel, very low labor, but then we have very precise pointing with an automatic software-based calibration system. And the method that we came up with is, again, possible because of Moore's Law, cheap sensors. Uh, 10 megapixel sensors now cost a couple hundred dollars. We put up a small tower on each corner of the field. We put a 10 megapixel sensor in the corner. We can look at the whole field by spiraling the mirrors around in the sensors and doing massive image processing on that. You can figure out where every mirror is, which mirror is rotating its position in the field. And we can have a feedback loop on when we see reflections from the sun. We can actually calibrate the mirrors accurate to 1 20th of a degree. So, um, uh, basically 10 or 20 times better than the half a degree that people get from the big mirror tracking open loop. We actually have a cheaper system that's more accurate all because of software. And this is how you can see it very vividly. When you first put down the field and you command every mirror to go parallel, they don't go parallel. They're off by plus or minus two or three degrees because the end stops and all the mirrors are at different places because the metal's a little bit curved. There's thermal expansion and bending of the metal during shipping. The, f the ground isn't flat. and you, you can't quite tell, but if you're looking straight down the end, th these are off far enough that none of the mirrors would hit their target or 5% of the mirrors would hit their target because of the angular error. But then after calibration, you can see the same row commanded to move to the position. And no human had to go down to do that. Just the software just looks at the whole field, scans all the mirrors, and then is able to control the mirrors. And once you can tell the mirrors to go, go straight, you can tell the mirrors to go point anywhere you want, and then have all the mirrors send their sunlight to the tower. So what it looks like when it's on sun, here's all the mirrors shine their light up to the tower. What basically happens is um, sunlight shines up. There's two towers in this particular plant. Uh, this is a 5 megawatt plant. Each tower is 2.5 megawatts. There's 6,000 mirrors on the south that shines on the south side, 6,000 mirrors, 6,000 to the north that shine here, and then 6,000 in that field and 6,000, so 24,000 mirrors total. And uh, when, when the command is given for the mirrors to track, they can all go exactly on sun, get all the light right into the receiver, uh, sort of glowing almost like white hot up there. And then inside there are some steel pipes. We run water through that. It gets turned into high temperature steam, comes down the tower, it moves over uh, here, and then goes into a power block, turns a steam turbine. So really, really simple, uh, well, complex but simple at the same time, and it allows us to drive down the cost of solar lower than the price of PV panels. Still not yet competing with natural gas, but getting closer, and I'll tell you what needs to happen to get it all the way over the finish line to compete with natural gas. But um, uh, right now we have this 5 megawatt plant running in Palmdale, and then we have a partner in India who has ordered 1,000 megawatts of this, and they've already begun construction of that. And we have a partner in China who has ordered 2,000 megawatts, and we're hopefully, hoping they're going to start uh, next year. So you, you can imagine, um, uh, with this lifelong dream of mine to have something like this, how proud I am of this, uh, uh, probably the only thing I'm more proud of this is, uh, is my son David, who graduated from Harvey Mudd, and uh, uh, did the mathematical modeling and simulation software that we use for this. So a special thanks goes out to him and to Harvey Mudd for uh, allowing us to get to this point. And uh, let me show you where we have to go still. Uh, if, if we're this close, uh, what still needs to happen? So let me show you some of the economics uh, very precisely. Uh, the best state-of-the-art combined cycle gas turbine power plants in the world runs in the 48% efficiency range. People are pushing 50%, but 48% would be a typical uh, power plant. It runs basically 23 hours a day. It can run around the clock. The capital cost for a one megawatt plant would be about 1.2 million. So a gigawatt plant would cost 1.2 billion dollars. The plant's pretty cheap, but the fuel's pretty expensive. Even with gas at super low prices of uh, five dollars per million BTU, that has to be expense of the plant over 20 years. So in this plant, the plant cost. Oh, if you take the 20-year life of the plant, the plant cost only is about 20 percent, and the fuel cost is 80 percent. So the, the, the plant is cheap up front, but then you pay over time. With a solar plant, the plant cost is 80%, and then the fuel's free. And the only 20% over time is operations and maintenance and servicing debt and things like that. So it's the exact opposite. So a solar plant is all paid up front, and there's no fuel cost, and the, the fuel, fossil fuel plant is low cost up front and lots of, lots of fuel cost for the whole duration of the plant. That's why it's so important to get the capital cost of the solar plant down, because that's all it is, is capital cost. There's no fuel cost. The fuel, the fuel is the free part. The sun is the fuel. So in a photovoltaic solar farm, the efficiency is about 19%. And um, you get about 5.5 hours a day of sunshine. That's on average. That's taking the non-sunny days, the, the sunny days, taking the short days and the long days. That's about the average over 365 days of sunshine you get on those panels. The plant costs about $3.25 million. There's no fuel cost. And if you divide out the 20-year lifetime production of this, it's about 13.5 cents, the about double that I said uh, compared to where we need to get. 
uh, tracking PV solar farms. Those are a little better. Um, you get the same 19% efficiency from the panels, but because you're tracking the sun, you can get about six and a half hours of sun a day. You get a little more sun each day. The plant costs more because you have to add the tracker, but you get that extra hour of sun, so it all divides out that you can shave a penny off the cost. And a lot of the big solar farms these days are going in with tracking, uh, even one axis tracking, because you can get that boost. But you can see how it's deceptive. The plant costs more, but you actually pay less for electricity because you're getting the more energy. Now go to e-solar a solar thermal power plant. We're getting about 35% efficiency, so we're getting a much higher efficiency than, than tracking PV, but still not as good as a combined cycle gas power plant. Second, we get a little more hours than even tracking PV because we have a two-axis tracker on all the mirrors, so we get a little bit more hours per day. The plant cost is pretty good, and we're getting down to about 11 cents, so shaving another penny and a half off there. So cheaper than other, other solar, but still not six cents. One next step that can be taken that we're working on at eSolar right now that we hope to get to in about two or three years is to add storage to this. And you would, we would add storage with molten salt. And let me tell you what molten salt does. Molten salt allows us to increase the hours of operation of the plant each day. We, we only get to use the turbine for seven hours a day. So we buy this expensive turbine, but only runs about a quarter of the time. We could run it two-thirds of the time, or even 100% of the time, with enough storage. And storing energy, I said earlier, was way too expensive when I tried to make that energy storage product in 2000. But that's because I was trying to store electricity. It's very, very hard to store electricity. It's not very hard to store heat. Heat is very easy to store. You just take something, heat it up, and insulate it. So energy storage of thermal is very easy. And that's what the great thing about solar thermal is, is you can add storage to it so cheaply. And one of the cheapest ways to add storage would be rocks. You can just have hot rocks. They're very, very cheap. Or salt. And the great thing about molten salt is it can run up to 600 degrees centigrade, and you can pump it. It's harder to pump the rocks around. But ro ro rocks would be really great. And you might be able to pump hot air through rocks to store as well. But the reason for the choice of molten salt is mainly because it can get hot without degrading, and you can pump it. So if we change our receiver in that same system, the place where the sunlight shines to molten salt, and we add a storage tank of molten salt, to get the storage to have 16 hours of power a day versus 7, you don't get that for free. You have to have 16 sevenths as many mirrors. You have to make the field bigger. But now you, all you have to do is add a tank, and now your same size generator runs for 16 hours. You don't have to increase the cost or the size of the generator. And that boosts the economics pretty powerfully. And that allows us to get, in striking distance, in two or three years, seven and a half cents. So seven and a half cents would be extremely, extremely competitive with natural gas, be a penny, a penny and a half apart. It might even be, if natural gas goes back up a little bit like it should, we'd be able to beat natural gas with no subsidy. And that's the goal, of course. If we can beat natural gas with no subsidy, that is huge. That means you don't need governments to be pushing this. You don't need laws uh, demanding people do it. It'll just happen. Power companies, instead of resisting it like they do, will embrace it. The whole, the whole thing switches, and it's a tipping point that is enormous. It's a tipping point that basically, if you could draw the sensitivity curve, because I told you these electrons are very indistinguishable from one another, the, sens the price sensitivity curve, you know, if six cents is a magic number, you know, at 10, it's small, at 9, it's bigger, at 8, it's getting bigger, at 7, it's going huge, at 6.1, it's ridiculous, and at 5.9, it's everything. You know, at 5.9, if someone can make more money by turning their gas plant off and putting a solar plant, they'll start doing it. I mean, you'll start actually turning them off. Now, it won't quite happen immediately because you have an asset you put money in and you'll continue to run it for a while. But it's just, it's that sensitive. You know, if you beat it by a, a tenth of a penny, you're really in the money. That either means that we'll beat it with no subsidy or it means that governments will make a very tiny subsidy. Like right now, I told you, in Germany, they're giving a 50 euro cent per kilowatt hour subsidy. 50 euro cent. Maybe if we get the price down to nine in the U.S., they'll have to give a two-cent subsidy. You know, that's pretty good. That, that, you, the, uh, a, a certain amount of money, a billion dollars, will last a long time. You know, it will go very far against a two-cent subsidy. It won't go very far against a 50-euro-cent subsidy. So it's just really encouraging that we're getting that close, but basically we have to cross this line. I really believe we have to cross it. I think, I think time is short. Uh, I think uh, I'm very optimistic. We're, we're going to definitely cross this line, not just e-solar, but I mean we as a civilization. We're going to cross this line in the next 10 years. The next decade, we're going to get there. But 10 years might not be soon enough. Uh, we really have to do it sooner because there's going to be big fights over resources, I think, if we don't do it in two or three years. Basically, all of a sudden, there's going to be a rapid acceleration in uh, use of natural resources once the recession ends. And you know, there's various views of how long it's going to take to clear things out, move out the housing, whatever, whatever, whether two years, five years, or seven years. But whenever it happens, 
you know, we're in a business cycle. When that happens, there's going to be a huge rush for natural resources and there are going to be big resource wars. You're already seeing resource wars between China and Japan and other things over resources to go into cell phones. You know, and cell phone demand is big, but it's not as big as our energy demand. You know, that's just enormous. So as soon as the economy picks up, there's going to be a lot of action and a lot of demand. So I, I think there's a, a, a big push, and, and let me summarize where, I, where I'd say we are. We're going to get to the majority renewable energy this century. It's going to happen, the century for sure. Like I said, I even predict this decade. It's just a question, is it going to be painful or prescient? If we're prescient about it and we work fast, we can get there before we have a fight over it. If, if not, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. I, I say we're going to get there uh, uh, but with certainty because we will get there because we'll run out of the other stuff. And we'll, the only way we'll be able to carry on our lives the way we like to is with, with, with renewable energy because the other stuff's going to go up in price too much. But there might be big fights if, if it happens the painful way. We have to do lots of things to get there. Also, I feel it's not just about climate change. It's about our style of life. I mean, you could make an argument of why you need to do this for climate change, but there's many people who are climate deniers. I'm not, but even if you were, there are many reasons to do this for our way of life and for peace that have nothing to do with climate change, even if you don't believe that. So there's really, really important reasons. And also, I would say it's not just a burden. Some people say there's going to be a big burden, economic burden problem. It's, it's not just a burden. It's a huge economic opportunity. There's, there's no business on the planet that is trillions of dollars a year like this is. So if you take a tiny, tiny sliver, you know, 0.01% market share of this trillion dollar business, you can make billions and billions of dollars. So it's really, really great business opportunity and not a burden. And then finally, I mean, uh, as I said, it's very hard to compete with fossil fuels with no subsidy, but that should be the goal. People should be really, really thinking about that and not, I, I think, spent, not spending as much time asking governments for subsidies and spending more time in the research labs finding solutions that can get us there, and I think we can get there. And then, of course, I personally believe that innovation, engineering, and science, not laws, not forcing people, but actually doing the innovation is going to be the way to get there. And I believe that entrepreneurship is the best way to mobilize minds to tackle this problem. Now, I was talking about this earlier, that, that it's not the only way. Um, scientific research, I think there's great ways we can drive more money into research, not just with entrepreneurship to get there. I think we need to do all of these different ways to tackle this problem. And then finally, since I've been involved with solar for so long, uh, through thick and thin, you know, through ups and downs, um, I, I would say this great, great, um, uh, great quote, uh, that new ideas like this um, are almost always ridiculed at first. Uh, people just make fun of it first, and I'd say we've gone through that phase with solar energy and renewable energy. And then, um, uh, then it often gets violently opposed because then people start saying, this might be a serious thing, this could threaten me, there's people who get threatened. And I feel like we're just at the end, hopefully, of the violent opposition phase. Uh, but then once something becomes obvious, it really becomes accepted as self-evident. And I think that innovation that we can make to push to get the price down will take away all the deniers and get us to the phase of self-evident. And that's what we have to get to, and we really have to get there pretty fast. So thank you so much for inviting me here tonight. It was an honor to be here. And, and I, re I really hope that uh, some of these ideas will inspire you to action to attack this challenge. Are you willing to take a few uh, questions? Oh, absolutely, yes. Stephen. Yeah, Bill, um, obviously one of our biggest competitors seems like in the solar technology, in the solar technology arena is China. What do you see as the relative advantages or, 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 or strengths and weaknesses of, of the United States versus China in this, in this aspect? Well, I really feel that we have more bold ideas, a much more vibrant venture capital market, and um, great potential to achieve the breakthroughs here. I think China has money, and they're throwing money at the problem like crazy, and it's, I think it's a smart thing. And uh, we have an administration that's having a difficult time doing that. We have a difficult time convincing people that this actually can be a money-making thing, not a money-losing thing. I think people are so focused on that this is going to cost people money as opposed to make people money and improve the economy. Um, so it's a, it's, a tough, it's a tough thing to get through. I think we're going to get there by necessity. I hope that, that even despite that challenge that I said, because China has so much money, there is a lot of money flowing into this right now. I mean, this past decade has been the biggest flow of money into renewable energy research in history. Uh, it might not be enough. Uh, there are a lot of business obstacles. We have to smooth some of the business obstacles. Uh, there was a funny story I heard. I won't get exactly right, but um, and I, I don't want to be an all um, uh, a denier of, of the importance of the um, desert habitat, but BrightSource uh, is building a plant 
I think in Ivanpah, and they uh, were building a 400 megawatt facility, and they uh, uh, solar thermal, same kind of idea with solar power tower. And it took them years and years to get the permitting. They're doing it on, on government land. And um, they uh, had to reduce the size of the project because people were complaining about the desert tortoise, that the desert tortoise was going to be a big problem, that, it, that their migration path was going to be moved by putting the solar plant there. Of course, it would be way better than a coal plant. The coal plant never got protested. Wherever the coal plants got put, they put it right on top of the desert tortoise and, and killed 40,000 people in the neighborhood by having the, the, the pollution from the coal plant. Uh, that seems to get through somehow. But anyway, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the desert tortoise problem, uh, uh, Bright Source had to pay $35 million dollars to remediate the desert tortoise problem in that area by buying land in another location and then picking up the desert tortoises and moving them to this other place so they could make a habitat. And it, was, it cost $35 million, and when they went in to move the desert tortoises, they just started working on this plant. There were 35 of them. So it was a million dollars per tortoise. So it was a little bit like buying a private jet for each tortoise to move it to its new location. Uh, uh, so I think there needs to be some realism about cost-benefit trade-offs to help us get over some of the hurdles to build some of these plants and to do some of this advancement. And um, I think that we, we need to try and have some of that levity in making our decisions about making this go forward here. I, I didn't see any uh, windshield wipers on your one meter panels. Yes. How often yes. do you have to kind of clean them off? Well, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, the the dust settles on the mirrors from both the desert and wind and dirt, and the mirror reflectivity goes down about a half a percent per day. So the mirrors are really high reflectivity mirrors, about 93 and a half percent, low iron glass, thin, high reflectivity mirrors, and they go down about a half a percent a day. So after a month, they're pretty dirty. You'd be losing like 20 percent, you know, 15 percent. Uh, to combat that. Uh, a lot of other companies have people drive around in the field with pressure washers and things like that, and they try and go. Uh, excuse me. They're actually cleaning continuously, but they have a schedule where they only reach every mirror once a month. So uh, again, we had some great people. I think there were some Harvey Mudd people who worked on this as well. Uh, built a, a robot cleaning mirror, mirror cleaning system. So um, uh, uh, the robot pulls up to the end of the aisle, commands the mirrors to turn this way, drives down the aisles and has washers on both sides, and cleans the mirrors at night so we don't lose any sunshine time during the day. Uh, so we clean the mirrors pretty much on a schedule every other day, so we only ever lose a half a percent to one percent due to dirt. It's a really cool system. <laughs> As I'm sure you're aware, uh, natural gas has come down in price because of a lot of new uh, discovery of deep natural gas that's uh, exploited with sh uh, short-term wells. So what's your estimate as to how soon that resource is going to be exhausted so that the price can go back up? Yeah, um, I think that the price, this is just my opinion, um, I think the price has gone down because the supply-demand situation is so low. I don't think we have to use it up for the price to go back up. Uh, here's something interesting about many of these commodities. Some very valuable things you dig out of the ground, like gold and platinum, those are expensive because of the value and how rare they are. But most of the things that we dig out of the ground that are plentiful, like natural gas and oil and dirt and rocks and things like that, they pretty much cost their cost of transport. You know, it's almost the, 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 the whole price of oil that we pay is pretty much just lifting stuff out of the ground for free if you have the land rights, whatever. And then almost all the cost, aside from the profit people are making along the way, is the cost of transport, the, the shipping containers, the, the, the pipelines, whatever. So the, the price of natural gas, natural gas is sort of free. It's just coming out of the ground. It's free. And then it's the pipeline cost and delivery cost. That's working out to be about $4, $5 per million BTU. It's, it's selling at that price, basically at its cost, because the supply and demand situation is out of whack because of the economy. I think it's going to go up to five, six, seven, maybe even eight dollars in the next three, four, or five years. You know, sort of that kind of time frame, not because we're running out, but just because a normal supply and demand situation kicks back in, where we're li we're limited by the transportation, the size of those pipelines, not by how much we found. The, the, how much we're finding it is not causing the problem. It's the transporting it. I think is the bulk of the, of the limitation in supply and demand. So we'll see. We'll see if that comes true, but I think it's going to go up. Certainly, I don't think it's going to go much lower because it's, it's at its rock bottom price of delivery right now. Similar to the first question, what do you see as the viability with, say, cooperation with China and then international cooperation yeah. in general? 
I think there's uh, uh, motherhood and apple pie. I think there should be more of that. I think there will be more of it. I think as more people realize this is a global problem and not just a one country problem, I think there'll be more of it. Certainly there's cooperation, partnership with companies. You know, China's shipping a lot of PV panels here. We're shipping a lot of this e-solar stuff there. They're interested in technology. Uh, both tr transfer both ways. Um, uh, Germany had a huge campaign to export uh, solar panels and work with other countries and also import solar panels. Um, I haven't seen as much collaboration on the research level, but I think there's going to be more of it. But I don't know what it takes to get there. Hi. Um, I actually had two questions. Um, first, I know that um, Solar Reserve just signed a 150 megawatt uh, power tower with Molten Salt in Nevada. Um, how are they doing by your metrics um, with uh, cost and, you know, using the, these Moore's Law techniques? Um, and second, obviously as solar and other renewables become more integrated, there's lots of challenges, utility regulations, transmission and distribution. In your line of work, uh, how do you approach those topics or do you uh, just develop the technology and leave those for someone else to figure out? Yeah, th th those are big problems. So let me, let me answer the first one first. So Solar Reserve is another company that is building a solar power tower with molten salt. I think it's a great system. I think it's going to be built relatively close to here. I think, uh, was it in Riverside where, where it was? Or I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, uh, I want that to succeed. I want people to see that molten salt technology is the way to drive down the price of solar so more people copy it. I think a lot of people, there was an experiment done with molten salt in the 1980s. Uh, back when I was doing my experiments, uh, uh, I think it was in Barstow, and Rocketdyne and other companies worked on that. It was a success, but then it was canceled after the um, uh, price of oil dropped. So bringing back that technology that was thought about so long ago, but bringing uh, new thinking to it, I think is valuable. I don't know enough about the details of the economics of Solar Reserve to comment on that part, but I think it's going to be pretty close as well. I think the only reason they're doing it is to try and compete with the price of fossil fuels with no subsidies. Then the second part, all the regulation, transmission, things like that, I don't really have the ability to do, do, think, do anything about that. That is uh, something that has to be done by law, I believe. I don't think you can be an entrepreneur and set up your own distribution system, at least in this country. Other places, developed world, you could do that, but I don't think, think you could do it here. So what we just try and do is get good policy in place and smart policy in place. Google is actually trying very hard to try and work on better transmission, mega transmission lines. There's also been a lot of talk. I don't know how many of you have heard about this, but there are plans. There's a big plan called Desert Tech to power all of Europe from the North, North African desert. And you know, most of Mor a little bit of Morocco, a little bit of Tunisia could power all of Europe. And they would have to have a big, big transmission line, big high voltage DC transmission line going the other way. They already have transmission lines that go the other direction that bring power from Spain into Morocco and from Italy into Tunisia across the Mediterranean, but they don't have big enough power lines to go the other direction. And there's, there's, there's some German companies talking about making a huge investment, like a $50 billion investment to build those lines. 50 billion would be a drop in the bucket compared to the savings if you did that because the sunshine in, in Tunisia is so much better than the sunshine in Germany, uh, that, uh, that, that would be worth it. And I, I hope projects like that go forward. And fortunately, the, the, Google, the Google guys are very forward-thinking, and they have a lot of capital, and they're, they're going to do some, some wild things where they can work around regulation. Like they're going to build a transmission line, I think, offshore to try and – or they're going to try to do that, uh, where they don't have to comply with some of the regulations uh, within California. Hopefully, one or two of those projects will work and show governments the way. You know, I wish governments – would be more scientific in their decision making, but sometimes they get persuaded when, they, when they're shown the way that things could work by entrepreneurs, and then uh, there's public pressure saying, why don't we do this um, uh, with laws, and then that can be copied. I hope that happens. Uh, hello. Um, there are a lot of people that say that the uh, United States in a zone throughout the uh, planet will be a desert by the end of the century. So maybe halfway through it'll be half a desert, but do you buy into that? And it, to me, it's obvious that we'll never get anything done across the whole planet yeah. in time. So what do you think about that scenario of being a desert that soon? Well, you said end of the century. Um, that's not that soon, but I think that's very doable. I mean, very possible. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 I, I, I think we are in a pretty precarious situation, more precarious than many people realize. And we were talking about this at dinner. There are a bunch of people talking about large-scale geoengineering as a last resort backstop to try and cool the planet if we make it too hot by other means. And that's a very scary proposition as well because there will be unintended consequences and there will be haves and have-nots, countries that benefit and countries that don't. And if, we make the, if the United States squat in the middle is turning into a desert and uh, the United States wanted to stop that, 
Um, and, fi and let's say we could fix that problem, but then some other country might be turned into a disastrous rainstorm area. So it's really, really scary to mess with it that way. Um, so I'm not proposing that. I'm just, just saying that uh, I think if we don't do something in the next decade, and maybe it could, some people even believe it's already too late, we're already on a trajectory, that even if we could like magically cut the emissions right now, we, we're on a course to a lot of places having their climate change dramatically, not just to desert, but all kinds of climate change, you know, floods, um, uh, erosion, um, uh, uh, water levels, and, and deserts. So I'm, I'm very optimistic that we'll find some technical solutions. I'm actually a little pessimistic on whether we can do it fast enough. We have a question over there, and then I'm going to take one more question okay. after that. All right. I want to go back to what you mentioned about the desert tortoise. Yeah. Um, I agree with you that there does need to be the trade-off. That said, legislation is notoriously hard to change. Um, people have talked at various points with using photovoltaics if you put them in urban areas. Could you do that with what you're doing with eSolar? That could be. Well, so one thing that eSolar is doing, it particularly because we can build smaller plants because of the smaller mirrors and smaller towers, we actually are only putting eSolar plants on already disturbed land to avoid this problem. So um, uh, we only are taking land that had already been farmed or used for some other, proper, some other purpose where there is no natural um, uh, creature there that we would be disturbing. Um, so that's our philosophy to avoid that problem. Some of the other companies need a bigger land uh, uh, in a single contiguous spot than can be found on previously disturbed properties, so they're going and using pristine desert land. So our choice to avoid that is to have a different technology path. Uh, but yes, you actually could put it in urban areas, on parking lots, on rooftops, and there's certainly enough of land to do that. Uh, uh, this technology uh, really doesn't scale down, the solar power tower technology, doesn't scale down very well, uh, much below about a two and a half megawatt single tower. So you need at least a several acre roof. It would have to be a you know, factory or a, a commercial enterprise, not a residential. But you can do a lot with residential. If PV prices come down low enough and the installation gets low enough, the installation cost gets low enough or gets built into ceiling tiles or gets built into new construction, then you can make a big impact on residential and then you have no, no, no problem there at all. Yes. Oh, uh, uh, we could set up on multiple roofs. Um, because our technology has moving parts, um, and because it has this power tower that has generating intense heat, I don't think it would be good to be unresidential. Um, I think it has to be behind a fence and secure and away for, for, for any, any possible injury of any kind. Um, but uh, all the other tracking PV solution, things like that, that could be on multiple roofs. Okay, last question. Yep. I remember reading that you uh, developed a solar collector that didn't rely on having to track the sun. It, it was really interesting oh. shape. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Whatever happened with that? It was meant yes. for you residential use. Well, that's a really, really great question. That's, uh, you've really done your homework on <laughs> the things I've worked on before. Uh, I was working very, very hard to try and find a way to make a non-tracking solar concentrator, something that could concentrate sunlight without actually having to move. And we actually used the Moore's Law thing there as well. So we used the genetic algorithm to design arbitrary-shaped dishes with complex contours that would, at different times of day, different parts of the dish would be activated, activated effectively because the beams would then c concentrate to a focus, and you could get a concentration level without having to move anything. And we were able to make that work. And the maximum concentration ratio we were able to achieve was three, three sun, three X. So with three suns, you can achieve temperatures approaching 200 degrees centigrade, but not 500 degrees centigrade. So it worked, but we were able, weren't able to get the high enough efficiency on the turbine side to justify it. But it is an interesting project, and it, it did have a, a useful result, but we, we, we passed on that and chose the e-solar technology. This was in thinking before the e-solar. We chose the e-solar path because to get the economics to work, we had to get the efficiency up above 30%. We couldn't get there with those low temperatures. Great. Well, thank you very much. You've been a great audience. I really appreciate it.